everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program as part of the Susa Mendes Foundation's series of Stories of Hope that we've been presenting on Sunday afternoons. My name is Olivia Mattis and I'm president of the foundation and it's my honor today to have this illustrious panel with us uh, to discuss really a touching, beautiful story that was made by filmmaker Yael Katsir. So first, I'm going to turn to our four speakers and ask them just to say a little hello to each of you in turn. So Dr. Indrimi. Thank you very much, Olivia, for inviting me. And thank you, Mordechai, for inviting me. Um, I really, we, I've known this film since uh, it came out and uh, it is a very uh, touching testimony about how people come together. So I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, later on, I will give a little map of the chronology and the geography that is behind the film. So that was Dr. Natalia Andrimi from the Centro Primo Levi. She's normally based in New York, but she's actually coming to us from Brazil today. Next, we turn to Dr. Mordecai Paldiel, who will also say a few words of greeting. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, always excited when, uh, when I speak about Italy during the Holocaust because of the debate that is still going on among historians, among researchers. Uh, I remember there was a, in the film, uh, Yael Katsir, there was an Italian who said, 80% of Italian were fascists, but they had nothing against the Jews. So that's really a paradox here uh, for Italy. I just want to say two words, what I found out in the film, the two beautiful things in the film, uh, for which I compliment you, uh, Yael. First of all, the women that came out from the Holocaust and they were in, in that place in southern Italy, suddenly all of them were pregnant and they were all bearing children. In other words, they were getting back to life. They were not going into any traumas and anything like this, but they married and, and they, they went back and they produced children. The second thing is the friendliness of the local inhabitants, the way they went out to be so friendly to these people who invaded their regions and took up their homes and even got more food and more clothing than they themselves, uh, they got it from the joint. So these are the two things that struck me from your film, for which I compliment you. Thank you very much. Uh, so Yael Katsir, our filmmaker, why don't you say a little hello to everybody? Hello everybody, and thank you uh, for inviting the film to be shown in those terrible days of the COVID-19 uh, lockdown or half lockdown or whatever you call it. And uh, I think that for me, uh, doing this film was a great uh, experience in my life and it uh, opened my eyes to the resilience of my people, of the Jewish people. And I think this, there is nothing more suitable to show during these days because it is really story of hope. Thank you, Yael Katsir, who's coming to us from Israel, as is Shuni Lifshitz, who is the star of the film. So Shuni, why don't you say a little hello to everyone as well? Hello to everyone and thank you very much. I'm really moved by the fact that uh, a simple idea that I had uh, at the beginning when I first came to see the place, the idea was that we, we must make a film about that story um, became such a big story and it's uh, been uh, showed so many times, hundreds of times uh, all over the world and it touches many, many people in many, many uh, points in their lives or their souls. Um, and uh, I think we can begin to Wonderful. So now we're going to go back to Dr. Indrimi, who's going to take us on a little tour of the history of what we're talking about today. And Matthew, if you could cue up the PowerPoint presentation, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, what I set up to do is to, uh, first of all, show where this uh, camp that you have seen in the film is, and it's in that dot, red dot, on the uh, southern tip of the Italian hill. 
Uh, one thing that may or may not have been clear is that uh, this camp, uh, refugees began to arrive in this camp in October 1943, so well before the war was over. What was happening in Italy at that time? So Italy in October 43 is divided in two areas. Um, the war front is just right past Naples. North of Naples are Mussolini's Italian Social Republic and the Germans and the beginning underground resistance. Um, and south of Naples are the Allied Army, the King and the members of the transition government who have fled there after signing the armistice. And at exactly at this time, while in the north, and deportations begin and Mussolini's government orders the arrest of all Jews on Italian territory in the liberated South, the Allied force uh, free the prisoners, both Jewish and political prisoners detained um, in, the inter in the concentration camps and internment, internment locations of that um, area. If we can slip past the slide, very good. So a few things about this uh, camp in Southern Puglia. Um, one thing that is very important to understand so is that most of the half, almost half of the life of this camp, the 15 month, first 15 months, happen when the war is still raging. Uh, while at the beginning uh, it's, uh, uh, it's organized by the British authorities, after November 1943, when uh, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration is created by President Roosevelt and the Allied Nations, uh, the camp becomes officially the f one of the first, and perhaps the first, I couldn't really find the exact information, but one, certainly one of the first UNRWA camps in liberated uh, Europe. Um, so much so that uh, the administration decided that will, this, this will be a model camp. This is where uh, all the protocols for hygiene, for teaching, for training, for rehabilitations will be developed. And so it happens because, in fact, the flow of refugees is very small until the end of the war, until uh, May, June, 1945. So the, at the beginning, the camp hosts, houses about 500 refugees in 1944 that become, uh, grow up to a peak of 2,600 refugees in 1946 when the closing of the camp is announced. And, uh, then go down to about 600 refugees in 47 before the camp closes. Um, there are also non-Jewish refugees that are mostly part, uh, Yugoslav partisans, Albanians and Greeks, who um, remain in that area for a certain amount of time, and, but they're slowly moved out. In any case, uh, one of the bases of uh, the Yugoslav partisan, partisan movement remains in a uh, uh, little north of that uh, area of Puglia. If we can pass to the next uh, slide. Um, so when the camp opens in 1944, the situation of Italy is, that, is uh, um, that of an occupied country. Italy was part of the Axis. Um, signed the armistice and surrendered and um, was uh, at all effect you know, occupied by the Allied and the losing part of the war. As years, the, the, during the first two years of the, the existence of the camp, the situation changes uh, dramatically. Um, it, first of all, it, Italy is flooded with refugees, over a million refugees, half of which are Italians, um, uh, are, are, are set up in DP camps in Italy. There are about 35 DP camps all over the country. Uh, the Jewish refugees are a very, very small percentage of, these, uh, of, of this uh, scenario. Uh, there are about 35,000. And uh, wh whereas in the first period, the Italian authorities remain and completely hands off on the question of what to do with refugees, they really, they're negotiating their post-war situation, they're ending the war, um, they're busy with other things. In 46, the situation, which is the year of this birth, is the year that this film really, when this film, uh, most of the film takes place, the situation is completely different. 
um, the Italian government regains uh, sovereign power. Um, the monarchy is abolished. There is a general amnesty that weakens the position of all of those who have suffered abuse, who are not, especially the Jews, who are no longer in the position of uh, seeking justice. Um, the Italian government is, is established um, with elections under the division of camp that will become known as the Cold War. Here are two um, posters from the 46 elections, one of the Christian democracy against, is already the, the anti-communist propaganda is very uh, strong. And uh, the other one is from the, uh, the Communist Party, the anti-American propaganda that uh, was concerned about Truman's intervention in Italian politics. Um, also the, the switch from Roosevelt to Truman um, causes a very big change in, in the foreign politics. All of these things affect the refugees. As soon as the situation in Italy is established, um, the pressure to expel refugees, to limit influx of, influx of new refugees, and uh, um, shorten the, the permanence of refugees who are in Italy, uh, there are a lot of regulations issued by the Italian government to come to, so that um, the question of refugees can be under its control and not um, control of other international institutions. Uh, by the end of 46, uh, the Italian government um, <clears throat> announces that its intention to close DP camps and uh, um, announces that any refuge that refugees that are not under the protection of URA will be expelled and will not receive any type of help from mm. the authorities. Now, um, this doesn't really happen because the, the refugee area continues until 1950, 1951, mm -hmm. and formally ends in 1952. Um, the, in this situation, the condition of Jewish refugees is especially tenuous uh, because many of them are stateless. Uh, th there is no repatriation program. UNRWA and the Italian government implement massive repatriation programs, but for most of the Jews, there is nowhere to go. Uh, sometimes they're stateless, sometimes their country of origin as border of change is no longer the same. They don't want to go back to Poland, uh, although in several want to go ask to go back to the Soviet Union, but already with the anti-communist propaganda, the Soviet Union doesn't want them because they are concerned about espionage. So um, they're not like all the other refugees. To this, we add that people who are in camps were, you know, who survived the uh, um, the very uh, big hardship and are just are looking to go somewhere and to make a life as we saw in this uh, in this documentary are taken up in a larger in a political situation for instance in 46 uh, the Irgun bombs uh, blows up the British embassy in Rome here is a photo there is a huge outcry in the press uh, about terrorism, how Jews bring terrorism in the country. And uh, uh, this causes a, a backlash for uh, uh, the local, right? the refugees are still in many urban camps, um, in uh, not only Santa Maria Leuca, but also in, near Rome, Milan, Padua, Naples. Um, there is another episode that makes the press and even the international press, um, a labor activist from a DP camp in central, in Northern Italy, rally with communist flags. And the, the reaction of the police is, is outrageous, is uh, disproportionate. They shoot them. They killed the two the refugees. I beg your pardon? No. Well, we have at a time when the, you see the, the, the poster, they're very similar to the posters of the fascist there, like protect your women from the Bolsheviks, protect your children from the, you know, the, the red danger. So 
there were very there were many Bundis, there were many labor activists among the refugees, the DPs. And they were not they sometimes they joined forces with uh, uh, Italian uh, communists. I mean, the Italian left was very big, but had contributed very importantly to the resistance. And here we are in a backlash where under Truman influence, they are ousted from the government. So the, it's, it's a very tense situation in Italy that obviously has nothing to do with the refugees. But as often happens, it becomes a, an opportunity to, um, to, to pursue an anti-refugee um, propaganda. Um, now, most of, uh, most of the Jewish refugees in Italy um, ended up going to Palestine. And I think there are two ships that live legally after the uh, creation of the state. Um, I don't think it's more than that. Um, we don't really know. There are, ma there are many. Uh, we don't know how many wanted to go where. This Italy was in a very, uh, only a very small percentage. Only 20% of the Jewish refugees in Italy answered uh, formal questionnaires about where they wanted to go, and they said they wanted to go to Palestine. But so for let, many let others, jump, let me jump in and now give the floor to Dr. Paldiel. Oh, Dr. Paldiel. okay. What would you like to add? Uh, I, I would like to say, based on my experience uh, in, as head of the Righteous Among the Nations Department at Yad Vashem for 24 years, uh, when we speak about Italy, uh, Italy has a very mixed Jewish history. There's been a Jewish presence in, it, in Italy for over 2,000 years. Uh, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, uh, some of them uh, made it to Italy. Uh, there was a Jewish presence in Rome under restricted conditions for all the times. At the same time, Italy is the first country that uh, introduced the ghetto. The first ghetto was in uh, Venice, and even the word ghetto comes from Italian. Excuse so me. It's very mixed. Uh, although I must yeah. mention. Excuse hello. me, Matthew, can you please stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Although I must say that uh, there was never the type of persecution of Jews in Italy as Jews experienced in France and Germany and in other countries. Okay, the second point I would like to make is I would like to divide the, the period of Italy in World War II to two periods. The one up until September 8, 1943, when the Italian government was uh, under control, under sovereign control of its own, and the period after September 8, 1943, where indeed there was a fascist government under Mussolini, but controlled by Germany, with German soldiers, SS, the right there in Mussolini's own headquarters. Why uh, is it important to make this distinction? Because up until September 8, 1943, uh, Jews were not uh, physically harmed in Italy. There was anti-Semitic laws. Jews were interned but nothing, uh, nothing comparable to concentration camps. And many Jews who had fled to Italy from Austria and other countries were allowed to pass through and proceed on. So compared to what was happening elsewhere, it was, yes, anti-Semitic persecution, not physical, not destruction, not concentration camps the way it was known in other places. After September 8, 1943, of course, the situation changes and worsens for the Jews. But let's not forget, this is when Italy is no longer a sovereign country. Although it has a puppet regime, the Solo Republic by Mussolini, it is really controlled by the Germans. Then the Jews are in danger, Jews are picked up, with the collaboration of those Italians who collaborated with the new government. That's uh, the thing I want to mention. The other thing I want to mention, that's based on my personal experience. I was a refugee child in France, in the Italian zone. We lived in Marseille and uh, under Vichy, and then the Germans came in and the words got around that not far from Marseille, in Grenoble, under the Italians, Jews were not armed, uh, they were not hunted down. So we sneaked across the border between the Italian zone and the German zone, and we lived in the Italian zone unharmed, untouched for nine months until the Italians uh, uh, 
gave up the war in September, and then uh, we fled into Switzerland. So uh, there's something to be said in favor of the Italian. I'm not a fascist. I'm not uh, apologizing for fascism. But the fascism in Italy up until September 843 was not as destructive to the Jews physically, physically, uh, uh, as it was uh, in other places. Uh, and the film brings out uh, the grassroots uh, tolerance of the local inhabitants. You don't see any anti-Semitic displays. Uh, the people who were there, we were not faced with, 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 with any animus or hatred. In fact, what I saw in the film, which was very surprising, that the Jewish uh, survivors, they, uh, they become rescuers themselves. In other words, uh, there's a lack of food and the lack of other supplies in that part of uh, Italy. And uh, the uh, Jewish refugees who were receiving uh, multiple amounts of food and uh, other things from the joint, uh, they began to share it with the local inhabitants. So this is very strange. There's nothing comparable that I know of anything else that happened in France and Belgium and Holland and any other European co countries where Jews who have survived the Holocaust suddenly are beginning to hand out food and clothing and shoes and things like that to the local inhabitants. So uh, this is something to be said about the friendliness of the Italian people. I say the Italian people. I separate that from the Italian authorities. Okay, one can say whatever you want about the Italian authorities, but I'm talking about the local Italian people, and that comes out very clearly in the film uh, itself. So, uh, indeed, there were not too many Jews in Italy, only 45,000 at the beginning, and then 35,000. But I think most Jews from, who uh, lived in Italy, uh, and they left, wherever they went, they don't have these harsh memories uh, and their conscience as Jews who came out from Poland, from Hungary, from Romania, and uh, even from countries like uh, Holland and, uh, and uh, France. I, my last uh, note is I want to make a comparison between Italy and Holland. Holland is also a country which was not known historically uh, for anti-Semitism. In fact, Holland welcomed the Jews, invited the Jews to come in. So there was not too much anti-Semitism, yet most Jews in Holland perished in the Holocaust because of the full German occupation. And the Germans were in control, they were in control of the Dutch police. So the fact that 78% uh, of the Jews in Holland did not survive has little to do with local anti-Semitism as such, as though there was, as with the organization of the Germans there. The German occupation in Italy also lasted for a year and a half, as uh, Natalia pointed out. And during that time, uh, the, you know, the Germans are better organized and uh, they took it upon themselves to try to get as many Italian Jews on the, to send them to Auschwitz. But most Italian Jews survived thanks to the help of uh, the local uh, Italian population. Uh, this is all I have to comment at this point. So now I'd like to turn to the star of the film, Shuni Lifshitz, to say some words. Hey, uh, I didn't consider myself the star of the film. Uh, I'm just telling the story, a beautiful story, which I uh, became aware of uh, only in uh, 2009. Uh, I always knew mm. that I was born uh, in a uh, very, in a place with a very exotic name, Santa Maria di Leuca, but I hardly knew where it was on the map. Um, but uh, after some uh, circumstances on, on a visit in Italy, in Tuscany, uh, I decided to go and see the place. And uh, in 2009, as I said, it was the first time that I came to see it. Uh, I came and was amazed. I was very, very, very surprised. I thought I came to paradise. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. The weather was wonderful. The people were so warm and nice. And on every step, I met uh, just occasionally someone who uh, knew the story of the refugees there, who remembered the story of the refugees, who knew some refugees. 
and um, I was amazed by the uh, by this fact and by the fact that even I myself did, didn't know uh, the whole story and uh, that's, that was the time when I decided that uh, we should make a film so that everybody else right, to share it with the, the whole world, this beautiful story. And uh, then I came to Yael Katsil, who is, uh, has been a friend of mine uh, for a long time. And uh, I suggested to her uh, to make the film. Uh, at first, she wasn't very enthusiastic about it, but then uh, he sa he, she said to me, okay, start research. And I started, and um, uh, the other uh, um, a woman, one of the, of, uh, the three of us, Esther Herzog, who is on the film, uh, I also uh, worked with her for many years, also in the same uh, college, uh, College of Education, that where I met Yael. And uh, by chance, uh, I, I discovered that she also, of all places, was born in Santa Maria di Leuca. And uh, so we decided to add her to the team. And she, by sheer chance, on a visit to Oxford in England, met another woman who also was born in Santa Maria di Leuca. So everything uh, uh, came by chance. And uh, we decided to go uh, on this film, all, all three of us. And these are the two, uh, the three women that you see on the film. Um, now, I think. Yeah. Now let's meet our filmmaker, Yael Katsir. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, for me, doing the film was uh, actually something that is not so <laughs> much about the Holocaust, but about the revival of the Jewish people after the Holocaust. And uh, it is exactly this specific moment after the war, when you see all the people who have suffered so much, having, finding the resilience to continue and to proceed into normal life. And in Santa Maria de Leuca, there were about 350 children were born there. And this is actually something that really attracted me in a way that I thought it is important to transmit it to the next generation, a story about the refugees who suffered and continued, who, who did not despair, who did not sit back. And uh, I think that uh, we, we worked on, on the film uh, for about three years. We went about three or four times to Puglia until we raised the money, you can understand it was not so easy, but still the, the, the whole uh, uh, situation that was there, the Italians on the one hand, and, but mainly the Jewish people who did not give up and continued with real, with, res, with unique resilience, this is what attracted me to, to do this film and to put all the effort that I could into doing it. And I was very lucky because we had a wonderful team. And you know that uh, a, a film is not the product of one person, it's a product of more than one person, of a whole Yael seems to be frozen. Shuni, why don't you pick it up there? And we had also a later a very good uh, editor, and I think that this is what uh, made the film. Can I say something to Yael? Say what? Can I say something to Yael? Yael, thanks to you. If I, if I had any doubts about the future existence of the Jewish people, you remove these doubts from the film. <laughs> when I saw the resilience, as you put it, and these women giving birth right after they went through the worst possible hell imaginable, I think that we Jews, we will survive. And the others, we will really survive. We got a lot of strength in us and nothing's going to keep us down. So thanks to you. The other thing I want to say is if I ever get to uh, uh, DeLuca, uh, I'm going to look up to see 
whether the accordion and the <laughs> wedding dress are still there. And I want to take a snapshot with that, <laughs> with the accordion and the wedding dress that was returned to Italy uh, it's doing not the in film. Loca. It's not in Leuca, it's in Santa Maria Albano in the museum. At the museum. Santa Maria okay. Albano. Yeah, it's in the museum. In, okay. We gave it the to museum. the museum to be exposed. Yeah. Yes. And I won't play the accordion. I just want to have a look at it. <laughs> and maybe there is one more thing that I want to say. We started the film with three ladies who were born there. And after two years of work, they have become a big family of 100 and almost 20 people who were born there and they were identified with the film and they went to celebrate their 70th birthday in Santa Maria di Leuca and I think this is wonderful and very unique. They came from all over the world, not only from Israel. Nachon Shumi, why Shumi? Okay, so questions are starting to accumulate in the chat window, and I do encourage people to put their questions into the chat window. Uh, so let's uh, have a few questions now, and then more discussion if, if you wish, and then more questions. So uh, there's a question about Italian, and that is, how come one of the three women spoke Italian if she was born there and went to Israel as a child? How is it that she spoke Italian? Should I? You mean Shuni, it's Shuni who speaks yeah. Italian. At first, when I first came in nine, two, 2009, I didn't know it, Italian at all. But I came then with uh, my, my late cousin and she made all the discussions and I didn't understand anything and it really bothered me. So I decided to learn Italian and uh, ever since I'm still learning and I knew some Italian uh, when we shoot it, when we shot the film and now I know more, but uh, you don't have to know much Italian to, uh, to ask the questions that I asked there or to answer many. I like, that part, I like that part in the film where the woman is giving birth and she's screaming, dollars, dollars, dollars. It's painful. <laughs> uh, Shuni, here's a question for you, which is how was the diary discovered? Oh, like everything uh, that happened in this uh, film, or, also this happened half by chance. I went to Yad Vashem to look for material when I made the research. And I saw, I think it was a video of uh, someone who stayed in the, uh, or a video or a written uh, testimony, I don't remember, uh, who stayed in the uh, camp. And he mentioned the name of uh, Meir Schwartz from Tibot Tel Yosef. And a very good friend of mine is, also came from Kibbutz Tel Yosef. So I asked her if she knew him, and of course she knew him. And she wa went to the archive of uh, the Kibbutz because he wasn't uh, alive anymore. Uh, and she connected me to his daughter. And the, and the diary was uh, at the daughter's hand. So she gave it to me, and of course, we all read it and uh, took out the things that were re relevant. She's very, very excited and moved from the film and she calls me from time to time to tell me uh, that uh, some friends of her show, uh, uh, saw the film and just would talk to me. So this is how it happened. So there are a lot of positive comments in the chat about how beautiful the film is, Yael, and I hope you realize just what a special, uh, document you have created with this piece of art. So there's a question which is, uh, how long was the voyage from Italy to Palestine? And I don't know who wants to answer that question. Uh, if I may, the, the voyage, you mean the illegal boats during yeah. that period, the, what is called Aliyah Bet? It all depended on the 
the foreknowledge of where the British Navy had positioned its own boats. Uh, it all depended on the contact that they had with the people on the shores, uh, that uh, by radio contacts, they were alerted when th the boats didn't go in a straight line from uh, southern Italy to uh, what's then called Palestine. It tried to circumvent the uh, British boats. So it went to close to Cyprus and around Cyprus. And uh, the idea was to discharge the, the human cargo on the shores of Palestine uh, without being detected by the British. Uh, because once they were detected by the British, all the refugees at that time were taken to Cyprus, where the British had built uh, refugee camps. So uh, the voyage of the boat could have taken one week or two weeks or three weeks. It all depended on what the situation was on the sea. Also, these were very small boats, the, the ones that departed from Puglia. Yeah, they were not luxury, luxury boats, of course. They were second uh, cranky boats, uh, overloaded. And uh, some of these boats uh, were uh, attacked by the British on high waters. And the British uh, found out and they took them and they towed the boat into Haifa. And then they were transferred to Cyprus. Uh, uh, I think one of the persons in the film, Yael, uh, was uh, told about being in Cyprus. Uh, when she landed in Palestine. She, was it you, Shirley, or maybe Ethel. somebody else? Ethel. But I think most of the uh, boats were uh, caught and sent to Cyprus. Most of them were, and some of them made it on shore without being detected, yes. So the, the question is, where did these boats tip, typically land, and were they diverted to Cyprus? What was the situation? Uh, they landed any place from uh, in northern Tel Aviv to southern Haifa. Uh, places like uh, Kvar Vitkin, uh, places like Atlit, places where there were not too many British patrol boats, uh, and there were Jewish settlements, kibbutzim, nearby, where once the people were discharged, they could immediately be dispersed in the Jewish settlements. So the area then was someplace north of Herzliya uh, to someplace uh, south of uh, Hadera, south. Uh, that's where most of the boats landed. Also no. Naharia, Rivka, for, for instance, uh, the, the, one of the, the three of us, they uh, landed in Naharia. Naharia, okay. Now here's a very important question which is why did the British not allow the refugees into Palestine? Ah, oh, well that, <laughs> we're getting now, uh, in, in 1945, 46, 47, uh, the British realized that they have to continue with the policy of the white paper, uh, that they needed the Arabs now more than they needed the Jews, the Zionists, because the, war, the Cold War was born, uh, Russia became uh, a threat, and it so happened that the Arabs had the oil, and it so happened that there were uh, there happened to be more Arabs and Muslims than Jews, and the British felt that if they had to keep the Russians at bay, uh, they had to put aside uh, any thought about opening up Palestine for Jewish refugees, but to continue the white paper policy of restricting to a trickle Jewish refugees into Palestine. So this was the British policy under the Labour government in 1945, 46, 1947, when they realized they could not hold on to Palestine because of the, uh, the attacks by the Haganah, the Irgun, the Lehi. That's when they turned it over to the United Nations. And the United Nations then voted to divide Palestine into two states. Uh, but it was still under British control and the British were still stopping. Uh, in other words, they were applying favor with the Arab countries. The British uh, created the Arab League in 1940, end of okay. 1944. The Arab League was created by the British. They wanted to keep the Arabs on their side. And uh, as in return for that, to, to keep as many Jews out of Palestine. And of course, uh, no talk about turning over Palestine, a part of Palestine, into a Jewish state. So what happened to the refugees who were stuck in Cyprus? That's another mm -hmm. question someone is asking. It's a little bit off the subject, but... They stayed there. When, when, when Israel became a country, the British opened up the camps and all the refugees in Palestine were allowed to come to Israel. 
after Israel became a state. Uh, that's when the British said, you can leave. The British were not interested in keeping these refugees in Cyprus, which they controlled. The British controlled Cyprus. So once Israel became a country, the British said, all right, you have your own country. Leave and go to your own country. Actually, you have to say that uh, they, I want to say, Shunigo, that they were they, uh, in Cyprus, they stayed in camps, which was uh, the conditions were very, very hard. And uh, Esther's mother said that uh, Cyprus was for her even harsher than, uh, than Auschwitz. It was so bad. And they had a quota, the British uh, had a quota of people that they allowed in, is in Palestine during uh, their uh, mandate here. And uh, only after the uh, um, founding of uh, the independence of uh, Israel, uh, all, the all the people who remained in Cyprus could uh, leave and come to, to Israel. But some people did come on the quota that uh, the British uh, established. And I want to say something else. The, the exodus that <coughs> left from Marseille was supposed to stop over in Bari and collect more people. But once they uh, realized that they have been uh, uh, tracked down by the British, uh, the exodus didn't go via Bari, but went directly to Israel, and then they were sent back to Europe, as uh, you all know. So uh, the, the people who left the camps and went to Israel, they have undertaken more difficulties just in order to reach freedom and a state that is a Jewish state. And uh, we have to appreciate them if not for other things, for this a great deal. So Yael, there are several people who have a question for you, which is how can, how can someone show this film to their synagogue, their community, their film festival? How can they They, they should approach me or Shuni and we will deal with it because there is a certain fee. We still owe some money to the investor and we are under a very strict uh, contract. So if they will approach us, we will uh, arrange it with them and we can always send them a link and they can show it the way you did show it and you were kind enough to, to make all the arrangements. So how can people find your website? How can they contact you? Well, I can send you my uh, mine and Shuni's uh, email and then they can contact us. It's not a problem at all. I'll send you tomorrow. You have my email, actually. Yeah. You have both our emails. Certainly. So they can contact us via our email. I think this is the best uh, way to do it. And uh, I want to say that by doing this film, for me, it was very, very important, especially today, when we live in a world that is so full with refugees, that also the younger generation will learn this chapter in history. It is not important uh, only to, to learn about all the horrors that the Germans have uh, uh, given to the Jews and to other people as well, but it is not less important to understand how people continued and, and proceeded after that. And uh, especially, when we talk about refugees, and I think this is what uh, actually I, I promised myself that uh, I will not do a Holocaust movie. I will do only things that are positive, that are full of hope, as you do stories of hope. But when I heard the story about uh, Albania, and I learned that 2,000 families came from Albania after September 8th, to uh, southern Italy when it was liberated already. Then I went and I did this film and invested in it a lot of my savings, but mostly three more years for the sake of spreading the knowledge to other people. And I think it's very important to understand that even in the darkest 
places, there are good people, there are people who are ready to stretch a hand and help the needy. So here's a question I don't know who wants to answer, having to do with the Jewish refugees in Italy. Did any of them actually settle in Italy and remain there? Very few. I'm, I'm sure. We know, we, I thought I'm not here. I, I we 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 did Italy. not deal with this question at all. We did not deal with this question, but uh, as my father would say in German, selbstverständlich, it is very uh, it's very likely that they some of them uh, did stay. We found one lady who who married an Italian guy, and she stayed in southern Italy, but. For her, it was not so easy because all her life she felt she was from Romania. Her parents, uh, her mother and her sister and brother-in-law went to Brazil. She always felt that she's missing the family and, and so on and so forth. So, but it is, it goes without saying that some people stayed in Italy. So one person is picking up on Shuni's a comment about Cyprus as being somehow comparable to Auschwitz, which is of course a big statement. So Shuni, I wonder if you could elaborate on your statement. Uh, there are many testimonies uh, of people. There were two uh, camps in uh, Cyprus, one uh, winter camp and, and the other was the summer camp. And uh, from all the camps, I. I I heard stories of people who said it was very, very difficult. It was very harsh there. The, the conditions weren't uh, good. Of course, they didn't suffer from uh, Nazi treatment and so on. But, uh, you know, they were expecting uh, going to Palestine already after all they um, went through. And uh, suddenly they, they, they are put again in uh, camps. Um, so, so it was dif difficult. I heard many stories, and particularly Esther's mother, Esther Herzog, one of the three of us, uh, she said, said to me, I heard her myself, that um, Cyprus was even worse than, uh, than Auschwitz. Now, you have to know that she came from Hungary, so she wasn't uh, a very long time in Auschwitz. And on the other hand, on Cyprus, she had a baby. She came with a baby who was less than a year old. So maybe that, that is what uh, made the difference for her. But she said it to me in these words. So I just quoted her. Okay. So um, there's a question about the woman in the film who marries in a Catholic church and what became of the family? Did the family return to Judaism? So I wonder if one, can, one of you can speak about that. The family, did not return, the family did not return to Judaism. No, no, no. She married in a Catholic church because her father-in-law told her, if you will marry in the church, there would be less gossip and less uh, hustle around this marriage. I mean, she fell in love with the Italian guy and he fell in love with her and they got married, that's all. And she stayed in Puglia and lived as a, as a Jew undercover of being Christian, that's all. But she said, that in my heart, I'm always Jewish. That's I all I can say. I want to add to that. In my work at Yad Vashem, we came upon stories of uh, Jewish women who married their non-Jewish rescuers, those people who saved them after the war, and they, ba they became Christian, they became Catholics, and, uh, and some of these Jewish women, uh, later on, uh, they kept the fact of, uh, that they were born Jewish from their children and grandchildren for their own protection. They didn't want to reveal them. And uh, some of them try to return to some kind of a Jewish life, but uh, which proved very difficult. So we have, uh, we came across many such stories in Poland and France and so far. Uh, we even have a story of a Jewish woman who married uh, the Polish man who saved her. And then they moved to New York 
And so that she said she practiced both Judaism and Catholicism. She practiced Pesach, and then they went to church on Christmas. Uh, and so it, there's a whole story there of many Jewish women that married those that saved them uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, many such stories that I came across during my work at Yad Vashem. And basically what is important is to remain human and to be a good person. And uh, whatever you call your God, you call it. What, Except, what? no, what I was trying to say is that these women, they, they wanted their children to know that there is something Jewish uh, and that they, they should know about their heritage True. a little bit and not to completely deny it or not know it. There, there's something in their subconscious is, I can't take the secret with me to my grave. I have to tell my children that they are part Jewish, something like that. That, that, that feeling was, came out later on in life. Oh, no, no, this is very natural. This is only natural. So let me take back the floor and tell you a little bit about upcoming programs, and then we will return to our four guests for some final thoughts. So we're going to take this series up until the Jewish holidays. Uh, then we're going to take a little break for the holidays. Then we'll start up again after that. So we have four programs coming up. We have two for which registration is open. Uh, the one uh, next week, this coming week, is about hidden children and their rescuers. And we have three hidden children on the panel. We have Abe Foxman, Abraham Foxman from the Anti-Defamation League, who was a hidden child in Poland. We have Ruth Hartz, who is a Holocaust educator, who was a hidden child in France. And we have my mother, I'm very happy to say, Dr. Noemi Perelman Mattis, who is a psychologist and was a hidden child in Belgium. And she specializes in trauma of adults who survived um, adult survivors of childhood trauma. So it should be a, a very beautiful program next week and I encourage all of you to sign up. The following week we have a very fun program about the cartoon character Curious George. No one knows that he was a refugee. He was created by German Jews Hans and Margaret Ray who were in Paris when the Nazis invaded and they escaped on handmade bicycles uh, with the manuscript to the first Curious George book among their meager possessions. They were very fortunate to meet this man, Aristides de Souza Mendes, on their way. So the little monkey Curious George would not have existed if not for Souza Mendes. And we're going to tell that story in a couple of weeks. And that should be a very, very fun program appropriate for all ages. The week following, we're still finalizing the details, so I won't say anything about it now. And then uh, two weeks following, which will be September 13th, we have Dr. Mordechai Paldiel with Dr. Eva Fogelman and another Israeli filmmaker, Yoav Shamir, who has a film called 10%, What Makes a Hero? And there we will investigate how a hero, how somebody becomes a hero, or are they born to do heroic acts? It's quite a fascinating topic. It's a lighthearted, lovely film, uh, but it treats a very serious subject and that should be a fascinating hour, I think. So now I'm going to turn back to our four speakers for today. And we will start with some final thoughts from the filmmaker, Yael Katsir. Well, as a final thing, I think I have said almost everything that I wanted to say. But uh, when we showed the film the second time, maybe one of my best girlfriends from the youth movement who was the uh, head of the Supreme Court, uh, Dorit Benish, told me, now I understand why you did the film. And I told her, why, what, what do you mean? And she said, because your father, the gynecologist, he likes to deliver babies and you wanted to do a film about delivering babies. So, uh, uh, yeah, 
this is in a way it was unconscious, but I like the idea that so many children were born in uh, Santa Maria di Leuca and that they have years, uh, together. So I wish every one of you uh, good health and happy holidays and Shana Tova. And uh, I hope that I will have another chance to come and show you another film of mine. Bye bye. Well, Shuni, the floor is yours. Okay, I uh, don't have uh, many things to add to what I, really, I already told you. Um, as I said, I'm very happy that uh, um, we, we managed to realize uh, that film and uh, the ricochets are still coming. And uh, if you know, if any of you know of, of anyone who was born there, uh, please send them to me because uh, this is the way um, these uh, 120 people um, uh, approached me because people saw the film and they know someone who was born in Italy and then they approached me and I have at home all the uh, Xeroxes of the birth files from uh, the municipality of Santa Maria di Leuca. So I can find um, every, everybody, uh, for everybody who was born there, I can find their uh, birth file. Um, I, uh, I want to add that after making the film, one of uh, the three of us, uh, Rivka Cohen, a pre uh, she, she was re responsible for all the uh, pictures, the photos that all the children brought that, and we used them for the film. So she uh, arranged all many, many photos in an album, a beautiful album. And uh, we also have, uh, a, 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 at first we had just one album and then m more people uh, joined. And uh, so we have volume two of, uh, of this album. So this is another thing that we did after the movie. That's terrific. Dr. Paldia, let's turn to you for some final thoughts. Uh, for 24 years, I worked at Yad Vashem and I dealt with the stories of the non-Jews who saved Jews from the Holocaust. And I remember some people at Yad Vashem uh, came to me and said, Mordechai, take it easy. Don't talk so much about people who saved because it's going to distract from the Holocaust. We have to talk about the Holocaust. You're talking about people who saved and the people who get away from the oppression that there were more people who saved than people who were killed. And I said, my response was, on the contrary, when a person hid a Jewish person in his home, there was a reason why was he hiding that Jewish person? Because somebody wanted to kill him because he was born Jewish. So by talking uh, about the uh, rescuers, we, we, we talk about the Holocaust. That's number one. Number two, we have to show people that there is light, that there is hope. You can't talk about such a terrible situation of Holocaust and end it there and leave people hanging in the air and say, so what do we say about human nature and so on? Is it really that bad? Is there nothing to tell? We have to show them by real stories, not uh, imaginary stories, that it could be different because there were people who made a difference in all the countries. Okay, so for educational purpose, uh, that is very important. Right now, I'm also dealing, and I wrote a book, about Jewish people who saved Jews. There are stories of Jewish people who saved Jews, also extraordinary stories, and that has not been told for various reasons, which I won't go into it now. But I'm inviting you, Yael Katsir, if you're interested, I'm inviting you to get in touch with Sila Hershko and Yuval Alpan in Israel, and they have money too. There are two stories that need to be told about how many Jews in France were involved in saving most of French Jews during the, during the occupation, and also of Jewish youth in Hungary that saved thousands of Jews in Hungary while the Germans were there. And you should make a film like that. And I'm they sure- made them, be, they, made, they made a few films. Yeah, but uh, you, you know how to make a good film. I mean, <laughs> I saw your film Thank about you very Italy. Much. 
<laughs> so but I'm you, inviting you. You need you. a budget that for this there is a need for a very big budget. I don't, I can't afford it. I'm sorry. Anyway, I I feel that stories like this need to be told to yeah, show that the, that the people can make a difference and that there is a way out and that evil should never have the final word. Never. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so now I do give the final word to our expert on Italy, Dr. Natalia Indrimi. Dr. Indrimi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think I want to say something specific about Italy. Uh, but I want to look to invite everybody uh, to look at the fact that the refugee situation in the world has only gotten much worse than it was in 1943 and 1946. And I think that for all the, our good hope and good wishes on resilience and uh, um, human uh, compassion, um, we also have to look at this reality because otherwise uh, many of these stories about rescue and about positive um, you know, outlook on, uh, on tragedies will become or may become a cover for what we are uh, witnessing and what we are mostly being silent on today. And I'm sorry, I know that this is a program of hope, but I think that a little counterbalance uh, is always important. And thank you so much for hosting this program and thank you uh, Yael and Shuni for the beautiful film. And with that I'd like to thank our four terrific speakers in, uh, in Brazil, in New Jersey, in Israel, all over the world. Zoom brings us together and that's a little bit of a silver lining with this uh, COVID situation and these Zoom programs is that uh, suddenly geography is no longer a barrier and we can have programs that bring people together from wherever they are. So with that, I would like to invite you to join us for our next program. You will receive an email later this afternoon with the information about how to sign up. And I wish all of you a nice rest of your day, whatever time zone you're in, and I thank you for your time. Bye-bye, everybody.